I think it is clear to believe in the power of ideas. Fresh, thank you for the Manhattan Institute. Thank you, Larry. Among my uh, characteristics is a profound um, um, uh, disrespect for the mainstream media. But the mainstream media, but the mainstream media has it right when they, um, uh, more than one person has called Governor Barber uh, the most powerful Republican in American politics. Um, Haley is only the second Republican governor in Mississippi history, and he's on his second term. Uh, he currently serves as chairman of the Republican Governors Association, and that uh, incredibly effective group is responsible for uh, 37 governor's races this year, and um, uh, the, currently the balance is 26 Dems and 24 Republicans, and with uh, Haley's energy, intelligence, and leadership, uh, uh, that may uh, uh, adjust in 41 or 42 days. Um, um, he's, uh, his work uh, with the RGA uh, has taken him from coast to coast and uh, to many interesting places, including, uh, as we all may or may not know, Iowa, a very interesting place to, to uh, for Governor Barber to uh, hang out or pass through or stop for a cup of coffee. Um, but um, uh, this is all a, a walk in the park for the, um, uh, for the man who was uh, chairman of the, the Republican National Committee in 1994 when, that, um, when he ushered in the contract for America, the contract with America, uh, along with majorities in the uh, House and in the Senate. The biggest challenge for Governor Barber came in uh, August of 2005. Uh, and, you know, you've read a lot, you've seen a lot of pictures and uh, movies and shows and everything about um, Katrina. And uh, you see New Orleans, New Orleans, New Orleans. You don't see much about Mississippi. Uh, Mississippi is actually where this storm hit the hardest. And you don't see it because, um, because Governor Barber led uh, in, in an incredibly effective, humanistic and, uh, uh, and uh, uh, efficient uh, uh, fashion. The uh, response to Katrina and uh, uh, the cleanup and uh, left that coast of Mississippi stronger, uh, better, stronger, more prosperous uh, than ever. Um, while Washington and uh, other states were squabbling, uh, Governor Barber was getting things done, uh, creating central decision-making center, um, and communicating calm leadership. Um, his, um, uh, his, his leadership uh, and intelligence make him one of the smartest politicians of our time and one of the most likable. Um, uh, his southern accent um, to, to those of us who came from various parts of New York City, um, you can get easily, uh, easily confused when uh, somebody comes with a southern accent thinking that they're not the smartest guy in the room. And Haley is most of the time one of the smartest, if not the smartest guys in the room. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming our friend, the great governor of Mississippi, Haley Barber. Thank you. Paul, thank you very much. And thanks to the Manhattan Institute, Larry. Thank you for having me. And, uh, and let me just say how, how pleased I am. Uh, uh, when Paul first talked about doing this, we, we tried to decide what we could do without an interpreter. Uh, he, he, uh, he, he, he folded on that, and so I'm uh, this, this way. I'm, uh, I, I want to talk to you a little bit about governors. Uh, as Paul said, I'm the chairman of the Republican Governors Association, not to be confused with the National Governors Association, to which, which I belong, but the, the principal purpose of the Republican Governors Association is to elect Republican governors. And this year there are 37 governors. Uh, there are also, by coincidence, 37 Senate races. And uh, the entire U.S. House of Representatives and several thousand 
legislative races. Uh, so this is an election where even in the in normal times, this would be a high stakes election. Uh, however, I would suggest to you in light of what the administration and the Pelosi Reed Congress have done in the last year and a half, that the uh, stakes of this election are as high as any midterm election. Uh, Paul was nice to mention, I was chairman of, of our party, of the Republican Party in uh, 1994 when we won what the news media described as the greatest midterm majority sweep of the 20th century. We picked up 54 in the House, 10 in the Senate, went from 17 governors to 31 in that two-year cycle. And uh, uh, as proud as I am of that, the fact of the matter is this election is a hell of a lot more important than the election in 1994. Uh, that's just a fact. The lurch to the left by this administration in Congress is literally unprecedented. There's never been a time in American political history where you have seen any administration or national leadership swing this far to the left. Uh, a spending spree that would give drunken sailors a bad name. I mean, uh, we governors have a hard time even saying trillions. But there was a stage in the Obama administration where every month they had a trillion dollar program. Uh, and, and spending is a huge, huge part of what the American people are upset about. Uh, you, you, people understand we can't spend ourselves rich. Your family can't spend itself rich. The government can't spend itself rich. And the public understands that. I think uh, maybe more than any other time in my career, been a pretty long career. Uh, we are seeing spending more the issue than deficit. Uh, they, of course, totally related. Uh, secondly, of course, the public is agitated over jobs in the economy. At a time when job creation is the greatest need for most American families, instead we see the country spend more than a year on health care reform. Uh, a health care reform bill that at the end of the day makes it harder to create jobs. It's anti-job creation. Punishes the people who are the most likely to create jobs. And now, as we come to the end of the Bush tax cuts and the question of whether to extend them, we see this administration saying we want big tax increases on the people who are most likely to create jobs. Forty-eight percent of the income of small businesses, which create most jobs in most states, forty-eight percent of the income of small businesses is going to be subjected to a big tax increase because most small businesses, or many small businesses, file their returns as individuals, as proprietors, partnerships, or subchapter sub S corporations. And in fact, forty-eight percent of that total income will be subjected to a higher tax. People know this is backwards and they're mad about it. Uh, and it's not that unusual in politics for people to get mad. <laughs> Ask any governor. Uh, but what has gone a lot farther, I think, is that the anxiety and the anger has really increasingly become fear of average Americans who fear that their children and grandchildren are not going to inherit the same country that they inherited from their parents and grandparents. Literally. And this is what the Tea Party movement's all about. Uh, different, different from the Perot movement, because it doesn't have a person around which it's uh, uh, based, but people who, most of whom, never been active in politics in their lives just got scared enough and mad enough they got up off the sofa, decided they're gonna do something about it. And they are basically middle class and working class people, very decentralized, very disorganized, but they gravitate to the same stuff. And it's a blessing for us Republicans, it's the same stuff that's basic Republican philosophy. Uh, and it's, that's why they are our natural allies and 
these elections, and it's why it's important that we don't do anything that takes their energy away, like Lisa Murkowski filing to run as a write-in candidate in Alaska, which is awful. But it, it, the left and the news media, I don't know if you need to separate the two, the, the left and the liberal media elite are going to say, well, this is just the Republicans stabbing the Tea Party people in the back. And I was very proud of Mitch McConnell, who didn't hesitate and demanded her resignation from the leadership, took her committee positions away from her, uh, for doing this. We who are in the leadership and the party organizations themselves have an absolute obligation to abide by the outcome of primaries. I mean, that's just a, a rank and file voters. I mean, we don't have loyalty oaths. We hope our rank and file voters will abide by the outcome of the primaries. But the party leadership, uh, this, this, this is uh, absolutely essential. Or otherwise, you could never get anybody to participate. They wouldn't think it's a fair, it's a fair game. And so, while uh, a lot of people, in, in, including me, think Mike Castle had a better chance to get elected senator from Delaware, the fact of the matter is, that Republicans in Delaware, in the largest turnout ever in a Republican primary, picked Christine O'Neill, and they've spoken, and she's our candidate. And then folks like me, that's who we're going to be for. Uh, and so this is a, an important year where some interesting things are happening. And in the middle of it are governors. Part of it because of the elections. Um, Paul said, we have 24 Republican governors today. Uh, that number's going to go up. Uh, hopefully it'll go to at least 30. If, if polling is to be believed, uh, today would be more than 30. If you look at who's ahead in the polls today, where? And it's interesting the breadth of Republican support. I've been asked by several people today about uh, Meg Whitman. Today Meg Whitman's ahead of Jerry Brown in, uh, in California. And I think uh, that is a good That's great. I think what you uh, my own view is that since Jerry Brown was elected governor in 1974, that there's very little room for him to grow. <laughs> and the poll. I, mean, I don't think there's very much about Jerry Brown that people in California don't already know. And so the question is whether Meg, you know, makes a misstep or has something uh, that causes her to lose. I don't think Jerry Brown can get to 50 on his own. Uh, uh, and we see that in a lot of places. Uh, a lot of competitive races. Uh, we're a little bit behind in Florida today. I think we will win Florida, but we had a nasty, tough, hard, bad primary. Uh, we'll win Texas. I won't win, win by much. Uh, but it's interesting to me, Republicans are ahead in Maine and have been ahead in every poll but one in Vermont. Some of you probably don't know that we have a Republican governor of Vermont today and a Republican governor of Connecticut and a Republican governor of Rhode Island. Rhode Island. 16 consecutive years with a Republican governor. That ain't natural. I can, that. <laughs> I can tell you that. That's a hard state for Republicans. Uh, so the, the Republican energy that has been generated almost exclusively by opposition to Obama and the Democrat Congress is public policies on spending on the financial services bill, on particularly the health care bill. Uh, those of you who don't spend a lot of time in politics may not think about Missouri as most of us do. Missouri is the ultimate bellwether state. For president, it's almost always nip and tuck. Missouri had a referendum on Obamacare. Virtually no money was spent by anybody. 71% of people in Missouri voted against allowing Obamacare to go into effect in Missouri. Now, that's not binding because uh, the, the state can't supersede federal law, but it shows you 
how big the, the opposition is to this, yet the left crammed it down the country's throat uh, with some pretty unusual procedural uh, activities in a way. Uh, what are we going to do about it? You know, that's just, I think that's the, the question most people have. And for me, uh, my view of where we start is in the states. States are and have long been recognized as the laboratories of democracy. Uh, Ed Rendell, the Democratic governor of Pennsylvania, has said publicly and correctly that if you'd have let the 50 governors sit down together, that we could have come to 10 or 12 or 15 incremental changes in health care that 40 or more of us would have agreed on. But Washington doesn't work that way. I used to tell Trent Lott, my old friend from college, when he was Senate Majority Leader, I used to say, Trent, you know, just between governors and senators is the senators talk about doing things and governors do things. And when you have to deal with the reality of a balanced budget, when you have to deal with the fact that you know when a factory closes or you know when something bad's happening and, and you are expected to try to do something about it, not just talk about it, but to actually solve problems. It gives you a very different attitude. It, it does make you more bipartisan, but in this election, uh, you're gonna see Republican governors wide open for election Republican governors. It isn't going to be any bipartisanship on November the 2nd. Uh, we can work together at other times, but not on November the 2nd because the stakes are so high. Now, you know, I, uh, if I don't get anything else across here it, that I want you to understand, we can't wait till 2012 to start taking our country back. This is this election. <laughs> this election matters. A handful of y'all are old enough to remember the Ed Sullivan show. Uh, you know, every Sunday night, 60% of the TV stations and uh, TVs in the country would turn on the Ed Sullivan show. And they say one night back in the 50s, he had Conrad Hilton on the show, business icon, the man who created a, a whole new business, you know, the luxury hotel chain, kind of the Bill Gates of his day. And Ed Sullivan brings him out on the stage and would quickly says, Mr. Hill, if you could tell the American people one thing, just one thing, what would you tell them? Conrad Hilton never hesitated. He said, put the shower curtain inside the tub. <laughs> now, there's a guy who knew what mattered to him. And he wasn't going to miss the opportunity. But what matters for me is for all you who are very so concerned about our country that you support this great organization. You and your friends and your families and the people you work with, they need to know this is the election that matters. 2010 is the election that matters. Uh, this year we'll elect governors and you will find that uh, governors like me, my uh, budget, my state budget this year is 13.3% less than it was two years ago. That's right, 13.6% less. When, uh, when I used to make my living in Washington as a lobbyist uh, not too many years ago, uh, or when I was in the Reagan White House, a cut in federal spending was this. Department's agency's budget is supposed to go up 8%. It's only going to go up 5%. That's a 3% cut. And that literally was the way it was reported in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal. That's a cut. Governors understand what cuts really mean. And uh, we're going to have another $600 million, which is my general fund's a little over $5 billion. So we're going to have another $600 million of federal money that's going to disappear at the end of this fiscal year. And we're not going to raise taxes. So since the economy is likely to only grow a very small amount, we're going to be back cutting our state budget again, a pretty significant amount. Uh, and I hope this time we will 
be able to do some restructuring in the process. Savings in government is not bad. It's hard, but it's not bad because we do a lot of things that are pretty low priority that we spend a bunch of money on. Uh, I am proud of the number of state employees in Mississippi today is the same as it was in 1990. Uh, we haven't grown state government in terms of people. Uh, we don't have public employee unions. We don't recognize collective bargaining. I mean, how can you call it collective bargaining when the union is negotiation, negotiating with the politicians the union elected? That is, that got very much similarity to uh, what we know as collective bargaining in the trade unions. Uh, though some of that got pretty sloppy in, the, in some of our businesses, but uh, we haven't uh, kept our payroll at the same size because uh, we don't have unions. We've done it simply because we've lived within our means. And that's true for a lot of other places. But you're going to see uh, states like mine are going to become increasingly the model as we restructure change the way we do business. A big part of that is going to have to come through federal permission. Because a lot of programs that we run that the federal government gives us some of the money for, they have control over a lot of the rules. But you're going to see governors pushing for more of that. In areas like Medicaid, uh, you're going to see much more <clears throat> competition in education. Uh, one of the things that is clear to everybody is that while we spend incredible amounts of money on education, 63% of the Mississippi budget goes to education. We're not getting our money's worth for it. Uh, we waste a lot of money in education. We don't spend enough on workforce development and job training. We don't spend enough on helping the kids that are not going to go to the university, who are not going to get PhDs or MDs, uh, we don't spend enough helping them get the skills that they can make a great living. Uh, when Toyota was negotiating with us to come and build a plant they're now building in Mississippi, uh, in a conversation that came up that an automobile mechanic in Los Angeles makes $100,000 a year. I thought, wow. So I called the car dealers in Jackson. An automobile mechanic in Jackson, Mississippi, with five years experience, makes $70,000 a year. That is a great job. That is a great job. Do we encourage kids who are not great students to do that? Hell no. I mean, if Marsha, my, my bride of 39 years, if, when Reeves, our baby, was getting ready to go to college a few years ago, if she'd have gone to the beauty parlor and said, Reeves has decided he's not going to go to Ole Miss. He's going to go to Holmes Community College, learn a trade. Now, what would they have said at the beauty parlor? They said, Marsha, what's wrong with you? Uh, well, we have that in state government. We have stigmatized skills training, and we're hurting many, many of our, stu of our students who could get, have great careers. Instead, as Mike Huckabee said one day when we were speaking somewhere together, he said, compared to 25 years ago, Today in Arkansas, three times more high school graduates go to college. Applause. And then he said, today in Arkansas, compared to 25 years ago, the same number as 25 years ago graduate from college. So what have we done for those kids? We just set them up for failure, put them in debt, cost their mom and daddies a lot of money, just because the colleges of education have made the decision that we're going to try to make everybody think they have to go to the university. Uh, there are restructurings like that that have got to take place. And as you all know from your businesses, sometimes it takes a crisis in finance in order to get those kinds of things done. We do it in, we've done it in my state in Medicaid. Uh, when I became governor, we had 720,000 people on Medicaid. Today we have 580,000 after adding 40,000 in this recession. Why? Well, we started managing the program right. Uh, to, in Medicaid in my state, 
you have to annually, personally reestablish your eligibility. You have to go down to the office, and there are a hundred and something locations you can go to, uh, and re-sign up. Huh? Believe it or not, thousands of people never did that. Why? Because they knew they weren't eligible. They had been allowed to stay on by just filling out a form and mailing it in every year. Uh, and the state was only checking one out of six forms. They were only taking one out of six forms to figure out were they legit or not. And the people who were on the rolls, probably a lot of whom signed up and they were eligible. When they got a job and they were no longer eligible, they just stayed signed up because nobody was watching. Mississippi has the lowest error rate of Medicaid of any state in the United States, about 0.4%. The national average for Medicare is about 11%. So for my taxpayers, by keeping our error rate low, we save them about $80 million of state taxes a year. That's $80 million we can put into schools, well, that's 80 million dollars we can leave in their pockets. But the federal government is going to have to learn from the states that you can spend less, and frankly, people won't even notice the difference. Uh, we're not an employment agency. Uh, let, let's don't forget that. The state is not an employment agency. And the Obama administration's idea that public sector jobs or as good for our economy as private sector jobs uh, reminds me of what Mrs. Thatcher once said. She said, socialism is great till you run out of somebody else's money to spend. And you know, hiring all these people with our tax money, you know, may make the unemployment numbers look better, but the fact of the matter, private sector employment is the economy. The private sector is the economy. And that doesn't mean government's unimportant because there's some things government does nobody else can do. But government is not an employment agency and bigger government does not mean that we're dealing with our employment problems. As you watch the Chris Christie's, Mitch Daniels in Indiana who is an extremely capable governor, Rick Perry in Texas, the fastest growing state, I think, or at least big state in the country economically, uh, you're going to see all of us have a lot in common. Seriously try to manage uh, the, the situation. I left out Bob McDonald in Virginia, a real hoss, and uh, going to be something. But we're going to have some more like these, and I hope you'll get to know them and watch them. Tom Corbett in Pennsylvania, Charlie Baker in Massachusetts, who I think does have a very good chance to win. John Kasich, who some of you know in Ohio. Rick Snyder, who was the CEO of Gateway Computers in Michigan. Uh, Scott Walker, who's now the county executive of Milwaukee County, who will likely be the governor in, in another six weeks. Uh, Bill Brady in, in, the, in uh, Illinois and uh, Terry Branstead in Iowa. The reason you go to Iowa, Mr. Singer, is that uh, we have governor's races in Iowa. <laughs> we have governor's races in New Hampshire, Nevada, South Carolina. Duh. Uh, it, 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 anyway, I think you're going to love some of these people. I think something else you're going to be interested in. Right now, it looks like we'll elect two Hispanic Republican governors, Brian Sandoval in uh, Nevada, and a spectacular a uh, woman in New Mexico who is a uh, uh, prosecuting attorney right now, uh, Martinez, Susanna Martinez, thank you, Annie. So it's good to have staff around. Susanna Martinez. Uh, also, we have an Indian American governor now and are likely to have a second one, uh, Nikki Haley from, uh, from South Carolina. We have more women as our nominees than we've ever had uh, than we've ever had before. So it's an interesting, uh, it's an interesting group. And how good is the environment? It's better than '94, uh, and has been for some time. But remember, six weeks is eternity in political campaigns. We used to say when I got started in this business that campaigns started Labor Day, and that 10% of what happened, 10% of what matters, happens before Labor Day. 
and 90% of what matters happens after Labor Day. Well, the news world has changed that some, but I will say to you, a lot of what matters in these races is yet to happen. A lot. And just because we've got a lot of leads in a lot of places doesn't, it is not foreordained that we're going to win all these races. So those of you that are helping our guys, I hope you'll continue to help. And uh, I think you will see and the Institute will see that a lot of the people that come out of these governor's races, and maybe including some Democrats, are going to be very attractive with the ideas that they are pushing up from the bottom that as welfare reform was done by Republican governors before 1996, uh, in the welfare reform bill that President Clinton signed in 1996 was written by the Republican governors who had actually done welfare reform in their states in the preceding years. And I think you'll see more of that. I sure hope so. With that, thank you very much. I'm glad to take any questions I, I told Larry. Yes, sir. Michael Myers, Executive Director of the New York Civil Rights Coalition. I'm on the left, but one of my favorite politicians, Haley Barber, said, I may have been born at night, but I wasn't born last night. Haley Barber says it was kind of things. <laughs> I love Haley Barber. My question to you is how do you sell the Republican brand, a Republican brand that says limited government and low taxes and stop expanding the federal government, how will you sell it when the Republicans, when they're in power and when the Republicans are out of power, support off-budget funding of wars like in Iraq and Afghanistan? And, well, uh, and, wait, wait, and, my quest, and, and when, the, when, when the Republican Party and the Republican leadership is always using government to butt into people's personal business, including the women's womb, and in terms of definition of marriage. The answer to, to, to your question is Republicans got beat in 06 and 08 because we deserved it. I mean, we had not stayed faithful to what we campaigned on, what we told people we'd do, and a lot of people didn't like it. Took, uh, took a lot of energy uh, out of our side, and we lost. That's the way the system works. Uh, however, I, I would simply not try to justify the fact that when Bush was president for eight years, the national debt increased $2 trillion. In President Obama's first two years, the national debt's going to increase $4 trillion. Now, that's a factor, uh, that, that's a mighty high factor, let's just say. It's about eight to one. Now, so yeah, do Republicans uh, uh, deserve to have taken their beating? They sure did. Did they learn from it? Well, I hope so, because they're going to get a chance to find out, because I believe that uh, we, we're likely to win a majority in the House, and uh, while we won't win a majority in the Senate, I don't believe we will have a lot more uh, control over what happens in the Senate, because in the Senate you don't need a majority, obviously. So uh, we'll see, and if Republicans are not steadfast about controlling spending, then they're going to pay a price again. And as somebody said to me today, we'll give you a second chance, but don't, don't expect a third chance. Uh, I, I will also say something else to you. Uh, I think it's good economic policy. Uh, I think the federal government today is soaking up way too much money uh, and that, that there is a combination of uncertainty about what financial regulation really mean, what does health care really mean, what are taxes going to be? And all of those uncertainties are making people sit on their money. Uh, but I think there's also the problem that the government is soaking up. Uh, the Fed printed a trillion and a half dollars last year. If I remember right, that's about the right number in it. What'd they do with it? They bought U.S. government securities. So 
in the old days, the print, the Fed would print a bunch of money and put it out in circulation. Well, they print a bunch of money and bought our own debt. How does that help the private sector? Uh, how does that help the job creation that we need? Republicans better be faithful to that. Uh, if they are, I think it'll actually help the economy. I think that's the way out for uh, for real growth. But it'll certainly uh, it'll certainly help on the on the other side of the ledger. And, and let me just say, Obama will clearly offer the Republicans at some point. All right, let's have a grand compromise on the deficit. Y'all agree to tax increases, and I'll agree to some spending cuts. If Republicans take it, they need their heads examined. Because the problem is not that we tax too little. The problem is we spend too much. And uh, <laughs> the, Yazoo, the Yazoo High, they taught us, when you're in a hole, quit digging. And that's what the country needs to do. We need to quit spending so much money and raising taxes is the enemy of controlling spending. I don't care whose legislative body, if you give them the money, they'll spend it. So that's, that's how I hope we will respond to uh, our sins. Governor Barber. I think it's working. I'm Josh Barrow with Manhattan Institute. Thanks for coming in today. I was hoping you could talk a little bit about incarceration reform. I think people have been a little bit surprised uh, by the trend, not just what you've been doing in Mississippi, but also Governor Sanford in South Carolina, Governor Perry in Texas, conservative governors taking measures to be smart on crime while also saving money and incarcerating fewer people. So I'd be interested if you could talk a little about the reform that you've done in Mississippi and then also more broadly what you think states can do. <clears throat> Let, let's start off with this. Uh, there's an appetite in the private sector to build cor correctional facilities and run them. And that's a heck of a lot cheaper for governments. If, if Mississippi ever pays to build another prison cell, I will be embarrassed by it. Because there are private sector companies that will build them, operate them, and charge us less per prisoner per day than we spend to operate ourselves. So we, we have, uh, one of the first things I did to reduce prison costs, and we cut the prison budget 5% the first year while the number of prisoners went up 7%. And we did it by privatizing, maximizing the use of the private prison, and also uh, a number of our counties have built jails that when they're not full, they like to house state prisoners, and most of them built them too big. Uh, and so we, we house everybody we can in the, in the regional county jails as well as that. That saves us a lot of money. But still, it's a very expensive proposition. We've brought our cost per day down considerably. But one thing I think we all need to understand, there's hardly anybody in prison, at least in Mississippi, who doesn't deserve to be there. But there are a bunch of people in prison that don't need to be there if we're talking about being a threat to the public. And so we're trying to learn more about who the people are that when you turn them, if you, if you give them parole, if you give them some sort of early release status, that'll do better. And I'll, and I'll tell you one thing that is, a, is an enormous uh, change in recidivism. If you give them real job training while they're in the prison, not not make car tags, but to give real job training, particularly for some applicable industry, the recidivism rate goes down to about eight to ten percent, of where it's, you know, in my state it's 34, and a lot of the country is a heck of a lot higher than that. But give them real skills to get a job, and it doesn't cost you much money uh, because it's the same training you're giving community college students uh, or giving somebody to, to hold those jobs. That's, a, that's one of the things that we have done to try to reduce our population, but most of our savings have come through management, management type savings. Somebody in the back. Um, on the question of, oh, oh, 
On the question of saving money uh, in prisons, in New York State, about two-thirds of our prisoners are in on drug-related crimes. What is your view on decriminalizing all drugs uh, so that all the innocent people who are killed in drug wars will not be killed, so the Taliban will not be financed by uh, having a market uh, for illegal drugs? What's your view on decriminalizing drugs to save us billions and billions of dollars and, and save a lot of innocent lives? Well, I'm against it. I'm against the decriminalization of uh, drugs. Uh, one of the things that you see when you're governor are some of the other effects. For instance, you see the children of mothers who were on methamphetamine or on crack cocaine, and those children in many cases are going to be wards of the state their whole lives. Uh, they, they, their, their, their health problems are so increased and magnified because of the drugs that their parents take. Uh, somewhere from 70 to 90 percent of the crime in my state are related, is related to drugs. Now a lot of that is very serious crime. It is not being caught with some marijuana. It's killing somebody to get money to buy marijuana. Uh, or in worst cases, uh, cocaine and methamphetamine, which is in, in many of our states, crystal methamphetamine has kind of become the drug of choice uh, as opposed to where cocaine was a few years ago. But they have, they have incredibly bad health problems, like I say, for the children, but for the, for the people themselves. Look at, I don't know if you've ever heard of a, of a condition called meth mouth. People who use crystal methamphetamine for some reason, one of the effects of it is it makes their teeth loose and actually not only discolored but misshapen. And a lot of these are kids. A lot of these are 16 and 18 and 20 year old kids who've got huge health problems for the rest of their lives if they ever get off the stuff. So yeah, some of my friends like George Schultz, for whom I have the greatest admiration, uh, advocate the decriminalization, but I just can't be for it seeing the effects. Yes, ma'am. My name is Alice Labrie, and if you could just tell us a few comments about how successfully you handled Katrina in Mississippi, I was very proud of that. Thank you, ma'am. Hey, look, my people are tough, uh, and, and that, that's, that's the biggest the biggest start of it is that uh, uh, Katrina is the worst natural disaster in American history, and we bore the brunt. Uh, it hit the Mississippi Gulf Coast, and it obliterated the coast. Uh, I remember flying over it Tuesday morning. The storm was Monday morning. Flying over Tuesday morning, the helicopter looked like the hand of God. It just wiped away the coast. Some place for blocks, some place for miles. Uh, we had more than a hundred thousand homes damaged. We had about fifty-two thousand homes destroyed. And uh, for a lot of, we had a new verb in Mississippi after Katrina. The verb is slab. Your house got slabbed. Well, that means there's nothing left but the slab. And we had probably 10,000 houses that literally were just gone. Uh, it's interesting, same storm, but Mississippi and Louisiana actually had two different catastrophes. We had the hurricane, the classic hurricane, greatest uh, storm surge according to the National Weather Service. Katrina had the greatest national, was the greatest storm surge ever recorded in the history of meteorology. That wave of Mississippi is 38 feet deep, with the waves on, including the waves on top. New Orleans had a rising water flood. The storm really missed them, but their levees fell in a couple of places. And, and what they had was awful. I mean, it was a terrible, terrible thing. But it's just different from what we had. Well, our people got knocked down flat, and they. Next day, they just got up and hitched up their britches and went to work. And they, they went to work helping their helping themselves, but they also went to work helping their neighbors. And 
Yeah, some of the federal programs didn't start off very well. The FEMA logistical system failed. But I want to just tell you something. If, if, if you get hit by the worst natural disaster in American history, do you think everything's going to work perfectly? You just don't know what you're talking about. Uh, when you don't have roads, don't have streets, don't have street lights, don't have electricity, don't have water, don't have sewer, uh, debris in Mississippi, if, 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 when we flew over the helicopter, I noticed everything just looked kind of gray. And when you got on the ground, you saw why. Everything was covered in debris, waist deep, head deep, sometimes as tall as this ceiling, 25 feet deep, because the storm surge was swept inland and then sucked back out over a period of hours, and it left 47 million cubic yards of debris. So it took us 11 months to clean up the debris. And people lived there through it, you know, and they just, you, you just, I used to have a partner, used to have the expression, no options, no problems. And uh, if you ain't got any choice, you just do what you gotta do. And that's what our people did, and our people are not into victimhood. Uh, they didn't whine or mope, and they weren't looking for anybody to blame. They just hitched up their bridges, like I told you. And, uh, at the end of the day, our coast is coming back bigger and better than it's ever been. Uh, population returned very quickly, and uh, we got the schools back open very quickly, very important. One thing you learn, something like this happens, people need a place to sleep, they gotta have a place where the kids go to school, and they gotta have a job. And so by the end of the four months, except for the casinos, all of our big, all of our big employers were open. You're, you're laughing about the casinos. The reason the casinos weren't open at the time, the law was that the casino floor had to float in the Gulf. When, when we had adopted gaming in 1991, it started off as riverboat gambling, and one very shrewd Mississippi legislature changed it at the last minute to, quote, dockside gambling. So that floor, the boat didn't have to pull off and go in the river because nobody would wanted to be isolated out there for two or three hours. So just right there next door. But part of the fiction was that they had to float. And we had, uh, for years, wanted to bring them on shore. Well, Katrina brought them on shore. Uh, <laughs> knocked down buildings, you know, land on top of school buses. Uh, <laughs> but the reason they weren't back open quickly is because uh, they were being rebuilt uh, to the new to, to the standard of the new law, but uh, I'm very proud of our people uh, there, and, and that's where the, the credit is, and the reason the story doesn't get written too much, you usually see New Orleans, the news media doesn't like to cover airplanes that land safely, and uh, that's what they've thought about us, and it turned out, had a pretty happy ending. Thank you, Governor Barber. I'm Seymour Cohen. You alluded to the reconciliation with health care, and I hear our Republican candidates talking about repealing health care. Wouldn't it be helpful to point out, because people have short memories, that this was passed by a legislative ploy that the late Senator Byrd, who formulated this for budgetary problems, himself objected to. So we're not just screaming repeal health care. We're asking something to be repealed that was pushed through with some trick and some ploy. And we're not, not just being negative. We'd like things to be done the way they're supposed to be done. There's no question that people found the process offensive. Not only repeated violations of the bird rule, but also uh, secret backroom deals, you know, the, the corn husker deal. And Louisiana got a special deal. Florida got a special deal. And, uh, and then uh, the way they instead of bringing it back up, went around the horn to, to, for final passage. Yeah, people are very offended about the process. But I, I'm gonna tell you, my own view of, of life is what matters is the policy. And people know it's bad policy. If we'd have been in here two years ago and I had said, I got a great healthcare reform program that I want you all to support. Now let me tell you one thing about it. 
it increases the cost of health care. And it'll make your health insurance premiums go up. Well, y'all have thrown rolls at me. And you should have thrown rolls at me. But that's what the country got out of this. They got a bad deal. That means you're going to pay more and you're going to get less. And that's what people are really, really concerned about. But you're dead right about the process. Uh, it was violated every, virtually every day as we went along. Look, uh, as the governor said, he has a busy six weeks coming up, so we promised to get him out of here in time. I just wanted to thank him for coming here today and for his outstanding leadership. I think it is clear how fortunate we are to believe in the power of ideas. To apply the common sense and the fresh thinking of the Manhattan Institute.